Hey folks, Eric Stackelbeck here. Welcome to the Watchman Newscast. You might news, notice the set, Stackelbeck Tonight, our brand new show on TBN, airing every weeknight, Monday through Friday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time and 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time on TBN. Well, we just filmed an incredible episode with our Israel All-Star panel. Now it's overtime exclusively for the Watchman audience here on YouTube. We are joined by a very distinguished panel, Tal Heinrich, spokesperson for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, also a producer, anchor who's seen on TBN, Eli Kohanim, former State Department official under President Trump, combating anti-Semitism, also a senior fellow at the Independent Women's Forum in Washington, D.C., and the one and only, we can call him that, Aaron Cohen, one of the world's top counterterrorism experts and a former elite member of an Israeli Special Forces unit. Hey, panel, welcome. Now, we just wrapped up the Stackelbeck Tonight Show, but this is great. No commercial breaks here. This is overtime uh, on the Watchmen YouTube channel. We've got a lot to unpack that we couldn't get to on the show. Uh, number one, what's on everyone's minds watching, I think, is okay. It seems that the Israeli offensive, at least to the naked eye, is stalled somewhat. Uh, Rafa is there and the prime minister says, look, we need to go in and finish the job and crush Hamas. And yet over the past few weeks, it seems to be a bit of a stalemate. There hasn't been a Rafa operation yet as the world howls and asks Israel not to go in. Tal, I want to start with you. Why must Israel go into Rafa, root out Hamas terrorists, and finish the job in this war? Because it's the last bastion. They still have four operational Hamas battalions there. It's about between 7,000 and 8,000 terrorists. We cannot leave them untouched. How can our citizens go back and leave in, in their southern communities? That's not possible. And I told you on, on the program, it's a decision that we took as a nation. We will no longer agree to life next to a terrorist enclave. We have done that for far too long, more than 16 years in which Hamas has been in power. We will not compromise our security. There will be no missiles again, no terrorism, no another October 7th massacre as Hamas vows to do again and again. Now, just to uh, uh, explain what's happening on the ground right now, it's not that the, the, the military offensive is, is stalled because a lot is happening on the ground and the IDF achievements on the ground are very, very impressive. Right now, they're more focused, yes, in the south and in the central part of the Gaza Strip where we have another Hamas operational battalion in the area of the Shifa hospital where we just uh, where we're just concluding a very impressive targeted surgical operation with commando uh, forces. Again, this Again. is not the first rodeo when it comes to Shifa Hospital. Exactly. November we, and now. We, we were there with many units, with thousands of soldiers. We, uh, we operated there. Many of the terrorists have fled. But now they return to the area of the, of the hospital. One of the, the terrorists uh, that we arrested and uh, admitted in the t interrogation that there, there are about uh, between 600 and 1,000 terrorists inside that hospital. You know, hospitals are supposed to be uh, uh, protected grounds uh, under... The, the international laws of, of war. Obviously, Hamas has no regard to, to international uh, laws of war. They are hurting the most vulnerable. But Israel, our special forces, went in there. They uh, eliminated... All, nearly uh, 200 terrorists arrested more than 900 um, and, and we know that they designated uh, the maternity ward for example the ER, uh, the MRI uh, uh, compounds uh, for terrorism purposes, for their management for, uh, you know, I have a colleague at the National Public Diplomacy Directorate he, he says that usually in a normal hospital a maternity ward is where babies get delivered in a Hamas hospital, this is where the terrorists get their weapons delivered to them. You know, Aaron, what Tal just lined out, or lined out, laid out, I should say, really drives home the point that, look, if Israel doesn't finish the job, Hamas is going to reconstitute itself and try to carry out more October 7th. Just look at what they're doing, or were doing, at Al-Shifa Hospital. In November, the IDF carried out a very successful operation cleared out this Hamas command and control center underneath the hospital, and then Hamas just returned a few months later. They're not going to quit unless they are roundly and soundly defeated. That's right. So, so the, the keys to successful counterterror operations, look, Israel didn't invent counterterrorism. It was invented by the British uh, uh, SAS. Uh, Israel perfected it. Uh, going back to the Entebbe raid in 1976, where we brought back over 100 of our own hostages, where Bibi's brother, Yoni, a national treasure, was killed on that operation. 
Counterterrorism lives in the preemptive uh, world. And so re remaining or remander terrorist 3-4 battalions in Rafa must be destroyed. The Israeli people aren't going to have it. I'm talking as a Jew. I'm talking as an Israeli citizen. They're done. We're done with the 134 hostages that are still being held that we're not talking about. We're done with the narrative shifts. Right now, Israel's preparing the ground war. And whether or not the White House uh, here in the United States and the government can't talk to this in Israel, but I can. The fact that they have been infiltrated by the propaganda and the psychological warfare, which has been used brilliantly by this terrorist group, it's time to get a very clear picture of the, uh, of the space here. Hamas must be destroyed. It's going to take barrels and rooms. Kanim, Bechederim, Kamosh Nachnon like we say in Hebrew, is very dangerous. We've reduced the air campaign in order to reduce any civilian colla uh, collateral uh, casualties because the White House has put that pressure on Israel. But now it's time for Givati, Golani, Nachal, the Palsarim, all of our elite infantry units who have been working brilliantly, uh, brilliantly to go in there and finish the campaign. It's dangerous, but Israel's going to wipe them out. It's just a question of time. They're laying down the groundwork right now. Yeah, Aaron, look, great points, number one. Ellie, number two, Israel, as Aaron just laid out, making tremendous progress in Gaza. And by the way, with... In terms of civilian casualties, look, Israel goes to extraordinary lengths to avoid civilian casualties, unlike any army in modern warfare, I believe. So why is the world howling and gnashing its teeth and targeting Israel? Israel was attacked, was invaded on October 7th. How all of a sudden in much of the world did Israel become the bad guy here? You know, Eric, I served as a deputy envoy to combat anti-Semitism for the Trump administration. And I hate to say it, but when you see Israel, the Jewish state, being held to a double standard that no other country, never mind any other democracy, is held to, when you see, like you just said, military experts like John Spencer say that the civilian uh, casualty rate in this war is unbelievable, the lengths that Israeli army has gone to protect Palestinian civilians, the fact that they are operating out of a hospital, like Tal just told us, and the World Health Organization has nothing to say about this. Hamas's strategy is to have as many Palestinians murdered as possible in order to put international pressure on Israel. And the fact that at the United Nations, it's Israel that they are coalescing against and condemning. All of this, Eric, I think shows us that it's anti-Semitism. Israel has become the Jew among nations. Yeah. I want to ask you more about that UN resolution, Ellie. Profoundly disturbing. Uh, Tal, look, it seems that the world in many cases is wholesale swallowing the Hamas line in terms of the casualties. When we hear statements released by the Gaza Ministry of Health, what we're not hearing is, that's Hamas. They're the quote-unquote governing body in Gaza. Could you talk about that disinformation campaign and what the Prime Minister's office, your spokesperson mm -hmm. for the Prime Minister, what you are doing to fight back against it and get the truth out there? Well, that's my job, to set the record straight. There's so much disinformation spiraling around, you know, social media, especially TikTok that you mentioned. Um, I think it's sickening. But unfortunately, people are falling for the trap. People lacking moral clarity are sometimes falling for the trap. And I call it the pro-Palestinian industry because that's what it is. Um, you see, if you put pressure on Israel, it's a lifeline for Hamas. That's the only leverage, the, 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 the one asset that they do have. This is what their entire strategy is based upon. And this is why they're using these sick methods of using civilians, uh, civilians as human shields, stealing humanitarian aid, because this is what they want. They openly say that they want to sacrifice the population of Gaza, Palestinian civilians, for their sick goal of obliterating the Jewish state. Now, every time uh, 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 people out there put the pressure on Israel, they're playing right into Hamas's hands. They want Israel to take the fire for their own sick methods. And by doing so, they're also incentivizing incentivizing their use of civilians of human shields. Uh, this is crazy that people don't get it, that they don't see it. Absolutely. And Ellie, I want to ask you more about the, the perception of daylight between Israel and the U.S. and why that's so dangerous in a minute. And that resolution. Aaron, real quick, you and I were talking earlier about the TikTok generation. It's one thing in the United States, uh, but in, and they're the ones who are being educated, quote unquote, with this disinformation. But in Israel, and I was struck by this in my recent visit to Israel, we talk about the unity, the resilience of the people of Israel. That younger generation in Israel, Aaron, 
they are impressive. Generation Z in Israel is not Generation Z in America. Let's just say that. Talk more about that. So it's interesting. Uh, uh, my last trip to Israel, I met with some friends of mine who were in uh, uh, command positions in the intelligence community and within uh, uh, Tzahal or the IDF. And uh, everybody was surprised that the dancers in the green IDF olive drab uniforms the have performed to a standard that has blown every generation of IDF Israeli who served. And what I mean by that is the 100 plus, 100 almost 50 days in Gaza, the intensity of this uh, uh, type of warfare, uh, 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 the amount of 90 degree angles, which is essentially what Gaza is, the narrow, tiny alleyways that need to be cleared. Uh, the actual IDF is being looked at by my generation and we're going, wow. They have performed, they have stepped up to the calling and they have been able to do in less than five months uh, uh, was taken the Western democracies almost 20 years in the global war on terror, uh, down to four battalions. So they have yeah. done incredible, and everybody's very proud of uh, this generation. Of Aaron, real quick, break that down a little bit more. What exactly they're facing in Gaza? Look, this is a densely packed, small strip of land, face-to-face, hand-to-hand, guerrilla warfare, jumping out from behind buildings. I don't know that any army in modern warfare has seen something like this in Gaza, booby trapped underground with terror tunnels. It's unprecedented. Yeah, let me, well, I, let, here, let me stitch it up this way. Uh, what you're seeing in Gaza is, is the largest hostage siege in the history of modern warfare. Uh, millions of Palestinians being held hostage by uh, Hamas. It's the largest siege in the history of modern warfare. And Israel's essentially rescuing the Palestinians, who I believe about 90% of them agree with Hamas. So go figure. Uh, uh, here we are risking our, our, our young soldiers' lives to defend and operate with the highest degree of selectivity a people who want to see us dead and are fundamentally aligned with the very terror organization that they elected. So yeah. not only is there a, 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 a paradigmal shift in the type of warfare that we're seeing right now, but as far as the complexity of the operation is tall alluded to, we have the largest human civilian shield being uh, uh, yielded in the history of modern warfare, which means that every operation has to be done what we call chirurgit, or with the highest degree of selectivity, to be able to make sure that we're not lining barrels anywhere near civilians. So we're deploying drones, we're deploying dogs, and we've lost several hundred IDF soldiers. And every one of them hits us really, really hard. However, Israel's really united right now, but it is as fierce as the urban warfare dating back to Omaha Beach wow. and back to World War II, where the United States and the Allied forces were clearing in order to uh, topple Hitler uh, in those cities. So I mean, some monsters, uh, Eric, but yeah. uh, the IDF is getting it done and they're gonna continue to get it done. This campaign will be studied in the years to come by military strategists, historians. I firmly believe That's that. That's right. That's right. The, the astounding success of the IDF here and doing it with a minimum of civilian casualties. Eric, we've got, a, we've got an Air Force uh, Special Operations Unit. I, I call them the archangels of the Palestinian people. And we can put, there's a unit in the IDF called Sheldag, which means Kingfisher, that can put a missile uh, into a specific part of a specific room within a building in order to avoid collateral damage to other structures within those buildings. So we have IDF commandos who are putting themselves at risk for the purpose of being able to shelter the Palestinian peoples, uh, again, who are opposed to us even yeah. being there. So uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe we send them a bill when this thing is over. I don't know, yeah. or an invoice. <laughs> and yet, despite everything that Aaron just laid out, that Tal just laid out, Ellie, we have the world calling for an immediate ceasefire, which would leave Hamas alive to fight another day. And as you mentioned earlier, the Biden administration earlier this week abstained. Uh, did not block a U.N. resolution. They could have, but they let it go through a UN, U.N. resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire, essentially saying to Israel, back off, don't finish the job, let Hamas live to fight another day. It created the perception, Ellie, and the administration says it didn't, but, you know, my lying eyes, as they say, I, I certainly felt a perception of, wait a minute, are they distancing themselves from Israel? What were your thoughts on that? Why was it dangerous? 
Eric, it seems the Biden administration is so caught up in domestic politics and wanting to win this uh, upcoming presidential election. And the fact that there's a radical left wing part of the Democrat Party, specifically 1% of Arab voters in Michigan, that seem to be driving the Biden administration's decision to indeed not veto that UN resolution which decoupled the freeing of the hostages from any kind of a ceasefire and also failed to condemn Hamas. Yeah. And Eric, I just want to say on your question, of why this is dangerous. Right now, if you look big picture, China is America's leading adversary. They are in an axis with Russia and Iran. And Iran right now, through its proxies, is attacking Israel. Well, guess what? This attack on Israel is an attack on the United States because Israel is our strongest ally. I mean, you can say really the only ally we have in the Middle Sorry. East region. And so the Biden administration's foreign policy, when it causes a distancing between Israel and the United States, when it distances the U.S. from our chief ally, it's a failure and it's a danger to all of us. You know Iran very well, Ellie. Look, your family fled Iran, was forced to in 1979 as the Iranian revolution unfolded. You're here in the United States right now. But look, the Iranian regime, you mentioned big picture a minute ago. The head of the snake, or some call it, have called it the head of the octopus, hey, it resides in Tehran. Not the Iranian people who are the main victims of this wicked regime, but the regime itself. I argue October 7th wouldn't have happened without Iran's active support of Hamas, its training of Islamic Jihad. Talk about how Iran ultimately is the real problem in the region. In 1979, Eric, when my family had to flee because we are a Jewish family and um, the regime in, in its very first days executed the president of the Jewish community, Mr. Habib al -Banayan. And we all understood that if they could kill the president of our community, they could kill all of us. And so uh, there were about 100,000 Jews in Iran. The majority of us have fled since then. And I am so blessed and fortunate to have taken refuge in the United States of America. I will forever be grateful for my beautiful country. The regime's ideology is a radical Islamist ideology. You have to just get into their mindset. They actually want to bring their Messiah into their world, the Mahdi. They believe, they want to eliminate Israel as a Jewish state. They cannot handle the notion of Jewish sovereignty in the Middle East. They hate America. They hate the West. They hate our values. They hate our freedoms. They hate the freedom the women have, our freedom of religion, I could, freedom of speech. I could go down the list. And Eric... When you look at the Middle East, all roads of instability and terror lead back to Tehran. Iran has been designated as the leading state sponsor of terrorism by both Democrat and Republican administrations now for 10 administrations. It really behooves the Biden administration to stop the appeasement of Tehran, to stop trying to enter into some sort of a deal, and they're making backroom deals right now. We need to confront the Iranian threat for our own national security, as well as for our allies in the region. A great point, Ellie. Look, in the Iranian ideology, and I'm glad you brought up that apocalyptic ideology, the Mahdi, the Islamic Messiah, they actually shape policy around those apocalyptic beliefs. But in that belief system, it's America that's the great Satan, in their view, and Israel that's the little Satan. We, we here are the ultimate prize. By the way, you have a great lineage. Iran was once known as Persia. I think of Esther. <laughs> Iran is a Bible land, the land of Persia. Got about a minute and a half left, guys. Okay, Tal, uh, some encouraging thoughts. Israel's here to stay and morale is high. Yes, I'll just, I just want to pick it up from where Ellie just left it. Not uh, an optimistic note, but it, it, think how dangerous Iran is right now with all the trouble and, and chaos it's uh, sowing around the Middle East and how much more dangerous Iran could get if it ever acquires nuclear weapons. Israel will never, ever allow it to happen. Uh, you know, we are in, in, the Prime Minister called it Israel's second war of independence. We're going to win it because there's no other choice. We will be safe. We will be secure. Our victory will be the victory for the civilized world. Uh, this is time for moral clarity and we need people of good conscience on our side. It's an existential struggle. Ellie, last thoughts from you. Look, you're encouraged about the Christian community and the support Christians are showing for Israel in its time of need. I was just in Israel. We were honored to uh, have a meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu. I was with a Christian faith leaders delegation coming to Israel in support of Israel. And I have to tell you, Eric, 
the Jewish people, we are so grateful for our Christian friends who are supporting us, the 82% of Americans in a Harvard-Harris poll who are still supporting Israel and know that Hamas needs to be eliminated and one day we need to address that Iranian threat, I hope soon. Yeah, Aaron, now on Stackelbeck tonight, which we just closed out before this, you had some words of wisdom in Farsi, a warning for Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei. How will you leave us on this panel? If you enjoyed the show Fauda on Netflix, which is based on uh, my old unit, I'm going to give you one in Farsi, talking to Iran, which is Behet Dasrosi Dorim, which means we can get to every one of these terrorist leaders. A good way to close, and that's a very encouraging note to close on. Aaron Cohen, Tal Heinrich, Eli Kohanim, folks, you can check them out across social media on X and elsewhere. Be sure to follow them. Panel, thank you so much. Number one, hey, we've got a live studio audience here. Number two, studio audience, thank you. You were great. Thanks for coming out. Quick reminder to subscribe to the Watchman News channel right here on YouTube. And secondly, Stacklebeck tonight. You see the set here, our brand new nightly show every Monday through Friday on TBN, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time, twice per night with great content, great guests like you just saw on this Israel All-Star panel. Thanks so much for joining us. Until next time, God bless you. And remember, never hold your peace. Good job, guys. Hey everyone, thanks for checking out the Watchman Newscast. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you never miss an upload. And tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget to share your thoughts, insights, and comments below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow.